Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. Vietnam has long excelled in its balancing act between China and the U.S., but that feat is turning ever complex in an increasingly divided world. We ask how Vietnam will continue its policy of non-alignment and succeed as an economic powerhouse. I'm joined today by Christy Zun Tzu Xu, Zhonghua Institution for Economic Research, Taiwan ASEAN Studies Center Director, and Tong Long Guo, United Daily News Deputy Editor in Chief. Christy Tong Long, a very warm welcome to the show today. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveled to Vietnam in April for the first time to push for a stronger partnership with Hanoi. This year marks 50 years since the peace accord signed in Paris, which withdrew U.S. troops from the Vietnam War. Joe Biden is either expected to travel to Hanoi himself by the year end or Vietnam leader Nguyen Phu Trang will go to Washington. Let's take a look at what Blinken said. The ties that connect our countries Vietnam and the United States have grown stronger and stronger. Today, we are, as you've heard, celebrating 10 years of collaboration through our comprehensive partnership. We're advancing together a free, open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient Indo-Pacific region, one that is at peace and rooted in respect for the rules-based international order. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Um, Professor Xu, let me start with you first. Why does the U.S. want to upgrade its relationship with Vietnam. Yes, um, um, uh, Blinken's visit was his first one as, as uh, Secretary of State uh, after the Biden administration took office. And before that, uh, actually last year in August, uh, the Vice President also visited Hanoi. And then uh, uh, following that, uh, the U.S. Trade Representative and several other uh, ministries from different uh, departments. All this show that um, uh, the U.S. is eager to develop a broader and also deeper uh, relations with the uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, so, why, why is the U.S. pushing for this? Yes, deeper, and, um, yes, there are several reasons for this. And the first of all, and the, the the Vietnam has been one of the most important player in this region mm -hmm. economically and also in terms of. Um, joining the U.S. in its uh, containment policy towards China. So mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, Vietnam's uh, 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 territorial disputes and also other historic complex with the China. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this regard, and the U.S. has been targeting uh, Vietnam uh, under its broader Indo-Pacific strategy, as well as the economic ties between the two countries have increased uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, the U.S. consider uh, Vietnam as one of the most important destination uh, when uh, uh, you remember uh, last year when uh, Finance Secretary Yellen uh, uh, proposed the French shoring uh, uh, initiative, which means that Vietnam is the m one of the most like-minded partners towards uh, the U.S. Uh, strategy to uh, 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 lessen uh, dependence on Chinese economy. Mm. Um, Tong Lun, so um, Professor mentioned there quite a few things. There's the military, there's the economic uh, side of things. Let's, um, let's, let's dig a bit deeper into the uh, military side of things. Um, what does a strategic partnership, an upgraded partnership between the two countries, what does it enable the U.S. to do? Uh, for a strategic partnership, that means that they can have more uh, military relationship and the U.S. can supply arms from now on to Vietnam. But before that relationship, uh, Vietnam had been very cautious. Like this visit, uh, Blinken, uh, Blinken had transferred uh, the third uh, Coast Guard boat frigate uh, to Vietnam. But that is only as a um, goodwill gesture. It's not an arms uh, uh, purchase yet. Uh, I think now uh, Vietnam is uh, desperately want to upgrade its uh, armed forces. Uh, both in terms of South China Sea and also uh, in terms of its border with China. I think that is the main concern mm. uh, Vietnam is having. But T Tell me about the border. Is, is there a border dispute? Is something perhaps that we don't hear yes, about the, so the much? The border they have, mm. uh, uh, Vietnam and China had a border war uh, back in 1980s mm. uh, when China want to punish uh, Vietnam uh, in a way that it's a, such a short war, it's about uh, two or three months. But that had caused a big rift between China and Vietnam. 
And that is in the context of Cold War and Vietnam had been invading Cambodia and China uh, want to, uh, to warn uh, Vietnam about that. But that had all passed. Now we are seeing that on the one hand, Vietnam want to be, uh, have relationship with the United States, but in the context of they still want to maintain ties with China. Mm. So uh, Blinken visited Vietnam uh, only uh, several weeks ago, but we are seeing that the Secretary General of Vietnam Communist Party uh, visited uh, China uh, in October. I think uh, just after the, um, the 20th Party Congress, mm. and I think the General Secretary of Vietnam Communist Party is probably one of the first uh, foreign leaders ever visit China. So mm. that show how close their relationship is. Mm. Christy, um, let, let's go back to um, what does Vietnam stand to gain then? We, we've heard what, what the US stands to gain yes. from, from having um, yeah. Vietnam as an ally in yeah. the South China Sea and yeah. against China. How about Vietnam? Um, I think it's very important for Vietnam to uh, keep uh, close relation with all these um, uh, superpowers around, uh, around uh, surrounding this region. And in particular for Vietnam-US uh, uh, relation, it started um, 20 years ago. And then uh, this year marks the 10th anniversary of uh, bilateral relation uh, into this um, a comprehensive um, a partnership. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely that uh, Blinken's visit in Hanoi this time will lead to further uh, upgrading our bilateral uh, relation into a strategic comprehensive partnership. Mm. So you uh, believe that they will do that? I think they are preparing mm. this because it's said that, mm. it's reported that uh, President Joe Biden may very mm. likely visit uh, Vietnam in July, sometime in July. And if you consider that China and Vietnam has already developed their uh, uh, bilateral relation to global, uh, to strategic comprehensive partnership long time ago, I think the U.S is very keen to further upgrade its relation with Vietnam mm. with regards to economic ties and also and also security collaborations including mm. arms sale and also much broader areas including education supply chain uh, climate change and all other issues so, so these are benefits to Vietnam as well yes yeah. yes Tong Lung, can you talk about um, you know China's reaction so uh, if you know to this strategic but possible strategic partnership between the U.S. You said it, it means that the U.S. can supply or under the agreement will be supplying arms to Vietnam. I think um, that is a delicate balance they add. I think Honey have been uh, doing. Um, on the one hand, uh, Honey have been keep saying that they have the four no's policy, meaning that they will, won't have a uh, security alliance with other countries. Uh, by having upgrade this relationship to strategic partnership, would that violate this for no? It's matter for interpretation. If um, Vietnam had been uh, improving its relations at the same time with Beijing, that uh, can somehow offset some of the pressure coming from China. Uh, I think there's another concern uh, besides this international diplomatic uh, thing is um, Washington uh, sometimes will ask and demand this, uh, if you want to upgrade relationship, uh, Washington will have high standard on human rights and democracy in their mm. countries. Do you think this could be one of the reasons why it hasn't been upgraded in right. 10 years? I, I, I think that is mm. the concern that Vietnam is having. Uh, don't forget, although it had opened up and become more and more market-oriented economy, but still Vietnam is under uh, a Communist Party rule mm. and uh, may, some people are saying that uh, maybe that is the U.S. model uh, for the future. They can work with Vietnam just like uh, they are trying to work with North Korea. So uh, there's no coincidence that uh, the second summit between Kim Jong-un and uh, Trump is happening in Honei because they want to set example for North Korea. You can be like just like Vietnam. You can open up your economy while you can still keep your uh, Communist Party rule. And I think this is the something that uh, uh, the ruling elite in Vietnam is very concerned, whether the U.S. would put more pressure on their opening up in politically. Right? Mm, that's fascinating. Well, let's take a look um, now. We've got some Vietnamese public attitude um, results of a survey taken 
by Pew Research. Now, this was in 2017. That was the, last, the, the latest year for the Vietnam data. But you can see here the opinion of the United States is very high. It's um, just below the United States itself at 84%. Um, significantly more the other Asian countries. Now here we can see opinions on China's growing economy. So survey respondents were asked wh whether China's growing economy was a bad thing or a good thing for their country. And you can see there the uh, Vietnam is at 64% and is actually uh, bucks the trend. So Christy, let me ask you, um, you know, let's going back to the US, yes. is it surprising that the feelings towards the US are so positive given the history of the Vietnam War? Um, um, some people may find it surprising, but if you consider how these two sides developed their relationship in the past uh, decades, it's kind of more pragmatic and very uh, uh, a gradual step by step. So I think it's n actually not surprising because uh, on Vietnam side, actually they rely much more on uh, a Chinese economy uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, supply chain collaboration and in terms of in particular uh, in terms of Vietnam is in need of China to support with components and raw material etc to uh, uh, to make a, 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 a Vietnam supply chain work and while the US uh, actually um, U, uh, US and Vietnam started uh, normalization of their ties only uh, in less than uh, less than 20 years mm -hmm. and then economically currently uh, US is uh, Vietnam's largest market mm -hmm. but uh, they try to take advantage of both sides so mm -hmm. I think if they want to balancing and then uh, for US they may feel disappointed but I think for China they think it's pretty uh, pretty uh, pretty pretty reasonable yeah. mm -hmm. let, let, let me add to that I mean uh, Blinken this visit uh, had opening up I mean uh, breaking ground with the new China, uh, new American embassy mm. in Honan. Yes. Mm -hmm. It cost about 1.6 billion. I mean, this is a huge embassy. Mm -hmm. And by setting up uh, this uh, new embassy in Honan, U.S. seems to suggest that our relationship will be a lasting one. I, uh, everyone remember that in the old days, uh, in the Vietnam War, U.S. is having its embassy in uh, in Saigon, which is now the Ho Chi Minh City. So it's a totally opposite. Now uh, the U.S. is recognizing that Hone is the capital and so on and so forth. Mm. But so, so it's them saying they want to get serious about this relationship. Right, right. Mm. It's a long-term commitment mm. that U.S. is having to develop a relationship with them. Mm. There's another thing, uh, according to your chart, it's interesting because recently I was uh, watching, there's a poll uh, in uh, South Korea. Uh, from the age uh, 20 to 39, uh, the people have negative view about China is 90%. Mm. I mean, this in South is Korea. In South Korea, it's mm. unlike, I mean, in, in the old days, South Korea don't like Japanese more than they don't like uh, Chinese. Mm. Now mm. it's the totally opposite. Mm. I think uh, what China have been doing in the past uh, 10 years, this kind of bully had really um, terrifying the whole, uh, the, uh, Asia Pacific countries. Now everyone is uh, heading for Washington to want to get a uh, U.S. security guarantee or hedging policy in, in that sense. Just like Christy has said, they want to make money in China, but they want mm. to get uh, the U.S. security commitment at mm. the same time. Christy, I might give the last word to you um, on that point. Um, however, you know, the U.S., as you said, it's been a short short-lived so far relationship but in that in that time it went from 450 million in 1995 two-way trade yeah. between US and Vietnam yes. to a hundred and uh, roughly 140 yeah. billion yeah. Yeah. Um, just last year yeah. uh, China's two-way trade with Vietnam in 2022 was roughly 180 billion mm -hmm. so uh, what's to say that that you know exponential rise couldn't that kind couldn't of actually uh, trade structure mm. so it's very simple it's the uh, Vietnam actually imports raw material components to pr assemble them and produce them into final products mm. to export them to the US so it's a kind of um, supply chain or it's kind of trilateral relation trilateral mm. collaboration C could you see the trade though with the US 
Uh, yeah, that, the yeah, trade with especially, China. Uh, yeah, especially uh, after the U.S.-China trade war and all this relocation of supply mm. chain from uh, China to Vietnam, making Vietnam one uh, now the third largest uh, trade deficit, uh, trade surplus uh, towards uh, to a uh, trade sorry, trade deficit towards U.S. So uh, Vietnam is actually benefiting from this kind of trade conflicts, mm. and I think they are trying to take advantage uh, as much as they can. Mm. Okay. Now we turn to Vietnam's economic growth, but first, this tragedy. A body found washed up on Taiwan's west coast. The discoveries have shocked the country and prompted a criminal investigation. Police say seven of the corpses were Vietnamese migrants trying to get to Taiwan, and they're looking into the possibility that they were trafficked. Four corpses are still unidentified, while the remaining nine are Taiwanese. Taiwan's interior minister says those people are unrelated to the Vietnamese case. There are nine People smuggling by sea to Taiwan is rare, but not unheard of. In 2020, police caught more than 30 Vietnamese migrants trying to land on the south coast. Prosecutors are working with the Coast Guard and local courts to investigate this case. And with seven more migrants still thought to be missing, there could be more bodies bound for Taiwanese shores. That report by Leon Yan and Stash Butler. Tong Lun, um, Vietnam has lifted 10 million people, this is the United Nations estimates, out of poverty over the past decade. So what's behind tragic stories like this? I think uh, more and more uh, people from Vietnam want to pursue a better life. I think um, a lot of uh, illegal immigrants uh, happened during the period. Um, uh, I think according to the reports, there's a lot of people, a uh, victim, had uh, come to Taiwan before. Uh, they probably don't want to pay up uh, the, tra uh, the, the, uh, the foreign uh, labor agent uh, any more money. They'll prefer to uh, take the fishing boat to have uh, that secret uh, come to Taiwan and, and, and earn the money from that way. I think um, it's tragic, but uh, I wouldn't say that become uh, a majority way of coming to Taiwan. I think the majority of them still come in a legal way. They, they come to uh, being employed in the family or they've been employed in the factory. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, such a thing happened is still, uh, is still a tragic, right? Mm. Christy, um, yeah, um, a terrible tragedy, and you sort of, you know, really feel for the desperation. Um, Songlin said it's not representative, though, of the majority, mm -hmm. and, and not, I assume that you're saying it's not representative of the economy. I mean, right. the Vietnamese economy has powered um, over the past decade and looks like it will continue to do. Do you? Agree. Yes, but uh, let me get back to this strategy uh, mm -hmm. because uh, in view, recall that uh, in the past decades after the Vietnam War, actually uh, millions of refugees are uh, fleeing into the U.S. into all continents. So as refugees, so uh, that shows that Vietnamese people are actually very determined to. Uh, to, to find better life for them. So they, that is a very different case with this time because uh, Vietnam has been one of the major source of uh, migrant workers in Taiwan. So this time, these people try to come back to work in Taiwan, but uh, because of this, because they are not being able to come in, in legal uh, approaches, so they have the they have it uh, in that way. So uh, Vietnam has been an economic, um, uh, I, would, I would say it's power, but so far it's considered to be uh, one of the uh, one of the young tiger in uh, in Asia, following the four young tigers uh, back in the 1980s. And uh, Vietnam has especially uh, prominent in terms of manufacturing industry, and also uh, 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 in particular with a number of sectors in terms of uh, 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 footwear, garment, textile, mm. and recently electronic mm. uh, 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 electronic industry. Do you believe it could overtake um, well, and replace China with a foreign direct investment? That 
that. Well, actually, out. if you look at this uh, foreign direct investment uh, going to Vietnam in the past three or four years, it did uh, increase a lot. However, I wouldn't say that Vietnam is going to replace China. I don't think Vietnam itself is considered it, uh, self to uh, be a replacement of the uh, world factory. However, it is indeed an Asian factory mm. with all these uh, FGA networks and mm. all these very uh, committed, very hardworking uh, uh, mm. workforce. Well, why do you not think that it could replace China? Because um, right now, the world economy is become fragmented. When you talk about this globalization, people argue that globalization is dead. However, right now, the, 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 the trend is that you need to have in different regions, different continents, different uh, supply chain. That means uh, the model like China creating one uh, single largest world a factory to produce all products to the world market is never allowed because different countries actually have their own uh, policy and they try to uh, depend uh, lessen dependence on China. So Vietnam will become no doubt a uh, Asian factory but somehow it still has a lot of challenges to face. Mm -hmm. One is they are facing this geopolitical uh, uh, tension and also this fragmentation of the economy. Another thing is um, Vietnam needs to, uh, uh, in our turn, need to uh, climb up this uh, uh, supply chain ladder. Right now, it's basically labor-intensive assembly work. It has to um, uh, develop its mid-trend and also up-trend uh, supply chain. It will take years mm -hmm. or probably that uh, more than one decade. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, one of uh, the factor that is really uh, become the engine for the Vietnam economic uh, progress is United States. I mean, ever since uh, about five or six years ago, there's a trade tension or trade conflict between the U.S. and China. Mm. A lot of factories are literally moved from China to Vietnam. Mm. A lot of Taiwan businessmen uh, did that. Mm. And also, we are seeing that the whole design of American uh, trade bloc, for instance, um, when Obama first started the uh, TPP negotiation, mm. they include Vietnam. I mean. Mm. Uh, Trans-Pacific right, partnership. Right, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, mm. I wouldn't say that all the Vietnam uh, law and regulation is up to that standard, mm. but somehow the U.S. want to include Vietnam in the TPP negotiation. Mm. Mm. That really also benefited from attracting foreign investment and all that. Although, mm. in the end, the U.S. did not become a member of the uh, CPTPP, but Vietnam is benefited uh, from the later on CPTPP grouping. Mm. Right? So, so uh, just to summarize, I guess you are saying that you believe that Vietnam can can stands to benefit essentially from this trade war between the U.S. and China. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Right. Christy, let's talk about um, the Vietnamese Communist um, General Secretary, uh, yes. Nguyen Phu Trang. Yeah. Um, you know, he was elected in 2011. Yeah. What do you make of his? His progress in elevating <laughs> Vietnam, in you know, growing its economy and in its in his foreign policy. Yeah, it's very interesting if you yeah. compare um, this uh, party, a uh, general secretary in Vietnam, and another party, uh, secretary uh, secretary general in in China. They are both reaching their third term, mm -hmm. and in the case of Vietnam, actually uh, Nguyen actually mm -hmm. uh, broke this record not to have two consecutive turns. So right now it's his turns, and why he can succeed in uh, uh, getting elected for in his third term because in the past um, years he has successfully uh, bringing. Vietnam into the world economy. That includes that uh, Vietnam is now one of the most popular destinations for foreign direct investment. It's playing a more and more important role in supply chain. And also in uh, 2020, when uh, the uh, COVID pandemic uh, uh, hit the whole world and Vietnam actually struggled to have very uh, a, a positive response to uh, to the pandemic, as well as keep uh, uh, as well as maintain a positive economic growth. That is something very very rare. So uh, uh, Nguyen uh, uh, boasted of his performance in leading uh, in leading uh, Vietnam past this pandemic crisis and also other economic crisis. So I think he is a very uh, legendary figure, and he is now considered to be a respectable and very carefully balancing uh, his uh, Vietnamese relation between uh, superpowers. And that's why mm -hmm. most of the countries uh, maintain to be in, uh, maintain to be in an uh, interest in developing relations
relations with Vietnam. Mm. So. But there's also the other side of coin, meaning that uh, Luan had uh, successfully uh, ruled out, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. taken out all the potential uh, challenger that he may have. Mm. I think uh, early uh, this January, uh, the uh, national president, uh, as another Luan, Luan Chun Fu, had been sacked because of corruption. I, I think uh, it's remind people how similar that Xi Jinping had started by wiping out all his opponents by using this anti-corruption campaign. Mm. I think uh, now uh, we can see that uh, this Secretary General in Vietnam is become quite clever in his uh, political maneuvering. And he is uh, most likely to meet uh, with Biden. Either Biden will visit Vietnam or he will be going to Washington to meet him in mm. July. Mm. Uh, that would be something uh, worth to be seeing. Mm. Right. We'll see how he navigates <laughs> this. Now, any hesitation Vietnam may have in upgrading its partnership with the US is not down to China, according to Jonathan London, a leading scholar of contemporary Vietnam. He is Leiden University's Associate Professor of Global Political Economy, Asia, at the Leiden Institute of Area Studies in the Netherlands. I spoke with him earlier. Uh, Professor, Vietnam has been at war with three of the five UN Security Council members. How do you think that shapes Vietnam's foreign policy? Vietnam insists on its independence. This, after all, is a country that had to struggle for its self-determination. And in doing so, it needed to overcome occupations, uh, of course, going back hundreds of, of years uh, from mainland China. Uh, of course, the French, uh, there was a period of Japanese occupation, and of course, the American War in Vietnam. And so under the Communist Party of Vietnam, the country has always had to really struggle for its independence. And so this is the fundamental starting point of its foreign policy posture. Many people are talking about strategic autonomy because of Emmanuel Macron and his trip to, to China. You know, the recent trip by Antony Blinken, Secretary of State, US Secretary of State, um, the Americans want to push for an upgrade to their uh, comprehensive partnership. Do you think Vietnam wants to go that way? I think that both countries are interested in a more comprehensive and even strategic partnership. I think, you know, there are um, labels about how to characterize uh, diplomatic relations that are used. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised if um, Vietnam and the U.S. are perhaps not yet strategic partners because that includes agreement over core issues. And there are fundamental differences. Uh, nonetheless, I think the most important consideration we need to address is these are countries that have really closely aligned strategic interests. I mean, this is one of the great ironies here. The United States and Vietnam, nearly 50 years after the end of uh, the conflict involving the US and Vietnam, in terms of, for example, the maritime disputes in Southeast Asia's uh, maritime areas, the US and Vietnam are very closely aligned in their interest in a more rules-based order. Um, the United States remains Vietnam's most important export market, and that will not change. You mentioned the Vietnam War. Of course, this year is the 50th anniversary of those peace accords between the US um, and, the, and the Vietnamese um, in Paris. So there is a, a big push. Do you think they will upgrade to a strategic partnership? You know, Antony Blinken really stressed that he'd like to see Vietnam at least come make a bit more progress on, on, on matters that, you know, the U.S. has been historically uh, concerned about. Uh, after all, this is, you know, a country that, you know, despite its many strengths, um, still could benefit from um, addressing some issues in the area of press freedoms and, and civil society and things of this nature. So. I do think there are those kinds of tensions. Uh, be that as it may, you have the U.S. you know scheduled to uh, build what will be the, one of the largest U.S. embassies in the world, with over a thousand uh, staff. You have cooperation going forward across a variety of fronts. These countries have come an enormously long way in a short period of time. So I think that conditions are ripe for certainly an upgrade in the scope of cooperation. Furthermore, we're you know in a very tense geopolitical moment, as you well know, 
uh, in Taiwan. You've spoken about some of the, um, uh, let's call them hurdles, in the way of, um, you know, a, a fully aligned partnership between the US and Vietnam in terms of, you know, human rights and press freedoms, that sort of thing. Um, is there something perhaps on the Vietnamese side where they uh, are worried or concerned about the reaction from China? Um, I don't really think that that's a huge concern. China and Vietnam have a special relationship by virtue of the affinities of their political systems and at least the you know formal levels of camaraderie. I think you know the Communist Party of Vietnam, like uh, China's Communist Party, are committed to maintaining a situation of you know political uh, supremacy. So I don't think that aspect um, is in doubt. I don't think that. Vietnam worries uh, about Beijing's uh, reaction. I think it, it crafts its own policy. The fundamental challenge and opportunity facing Vietnam is how it can leverage uh, the U.S. relationship in a way that promotes Vietnam's aims, including independence, sovereignty, um, security. What do you make of the progress under the current um, party leader? Um, and you know, could we see, because of continuing very strong growth, we often hear about Vietnam as being um, a, a sort of replacement, I guess, for for uh, as for as China in terms of uh, foreign investment, you know, manufacturing hub. Uh, I mean, Vietnam's prospects are bright. The question is, how bright will they be? I mean, it's widely expected that Vietnam will have one of, or perhaps the fastest growing economy until 2050. Uh, the current party general secretary Nguyen Phu Chao has been uh, somebody who is a creature of the party. He is regarded as doctrinaire uh, in the past, but he has proven to be a very savvy uh, political operator and has managed to uh, gain uh, leadership within the party. He has pushed forward uh, anti-corruption efforts that have yielded uh, very significant results, but not yet the systemic sorts of reforms that are required to really bring corruption to heel. Vietnam has a, a great opportunity, an historic, you know, uh, once in a century opportunity to benefit from some of the shifts that we're seeing uh, with respect to, you know, uh, the world economy. As you just mentioned, it has a great opportunity to absorb some of the foreign direct investment that is now trying to find its way uh, out of China. And I mean, there are limits uh, in the following sense. Firstly, you know, Vietnam is still a large country, 100 million people. Uh, that's significant. Uh, but, you know, much more importantly, the country really needs to accelerate efforts to improve skilling of its workforce. It is a highly literate society. It does better in international surveys of education than all other countries in its income group. So how do you see the U.S.? Vietnam partnership developing? What are the next steps? Rightly or wrongly, in the U.S. right now, uh, people simply want to move away from China. The, the China relationship is viewed as toxic. And so Vietnam, you know, even among, you know, critics, is viewed as a very appealing uh, destination. And so I think the question is how well the two countries can coordinate the cooperation. And in this context, you know, this very substantial expansion of, of the U.S. diplomatic presence in Vietnam is 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 interesting and something to watch. I think areas such as you know investment, tourism, education, especially higher education, these are the critical areas that uh, that we can look at in the U.S. Vietnam partnership. There's something special about the relationship between these two countries, despite their the violent history. Um, um, of, of the 20th century. It does appear to be a special relationship and, you know, America being, I guess, the, the bastion of the free world, de democracy, um, and, and we have communist Vietnam. Um, what do you, how do you interpret how Vietnam sometimes describes itself as a socialist democracy? Well, I mean, the U.S., and its democracy are in tough shape, really, and really in danger here. So I think that, in a sense, adds for the reasons for the U.S. to be careful uh, with respect to promoting, you know, democratic values. 
uh, you know, with respect to Vietnam and the extent of its, you know, socialist uh, republic, uh, this is a country that is, in fact, uh, deeply redistributive in the sense that you have the economic powerhouses of the country um, contributing a, a great deal to the central budget, which is then used to uh, support budgets in Vietnam's provinces. And so if you look at public goods in Vietnam, if you look at access to education and health services, there's lots of problems there, but Vietnam does better than virtually all countries in its income group in terms of extending essential services to its population. I think there has been increased inequality. Uh, people have used their political positions for private gain, as we observe, you know, in most countries. And I think Nguyen Phu Chao, uh, the current general secretary, as somebody who has always taken socialist ideas seriously, I think the question is, you know, what sort of economy can Vietnam develop over the long term? And so I think it's important to expand uh, economic opportunities uh, within Vietnam and in the meantime, continue the country's efforts to promote um, the ability of lower income and middle income segments of the population to find opportunities. There's no reason that Vietnam's economy can't grow in the range of seven to nine percent. Moving on to Taiwan, Vietnam ties. Um, how does Vietnam view Taiwan? I think that the relationship between Vietnam and, and Taiwan is fascinating. It's the most important relationship that you can't talk about. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the two countries have benefited enormously through close cooperation. I think there's a great deal of admiration for Taiwan in Vietnam. Of course, a lot of employment has occurred uh, in Taiwan of, 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 of Vietnamese workers. But I think, you know, more importantly, both from the perspective of you know, Taiwan's economy and Taiwan's development of a vibrant multi-party democracy that is staunchly independent, I think this is enormously uh, appealing to Vietnam's population. And so um, obviously there are constraints uh, in the relationship owing to geopolitical uh, circumstances, but I think that uh, Korea and Taiwan in particular are countries in East Asia that Vietnam's uh, population very much look, look, looks up to. Hello, I'm Ian Kavat of Taiwan Talks. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Feel free to leave us any feedback in the comments section. Christy, let's talk about Russia, which yes. along with China backed North Vietnam in the Vietnam War against Southern Vietnam and the US. What is the relationship today uh, between Vietnam and Russia? Uh, I think it's actually surprising to most part of the world that Vietnam today maintain a very close ties and supportive of Vietnam, uh, supportive of Russia, even after the uh, Ukraine uh, crisis. Mm. In what way do, do they continue uh, to support? For example, there are a number of votes uh, in the either the UN Assembly or other other organization that Vietnam either uh, either uh, did not vote or try to maintain its position because right now uh, not only about trade and investment that Russia is a very important uh, important partner but also Russia is Vietnam's most important source of weapon supply so and they, it takes time for uh, Vietnam to change the system from Russia to Western system so I think uh, same as uh, India's case Vietnam tried to uh, maintain its own national interests by having independent policy. So that is something that is already uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, in terms of trade and economy, Russia uh, is an APEC member. So uh, it's an APEC member. And also uh, Rus uh, uh, Russia in the old days is the place where Vietnamese people, Vietnamese students will go study. And that means that there are even today a group of people that have experiences uh, study or working in Russia. And now they are very influential in terms of politics and in terms of business. So take one example. Currently the richest uh, man 
in Vietnam, the chairman of the Vin Group, the largest group, uh, is actually a student uh, studying in Russia and started his own business, his first business in, in Ukraine. Mm. So for uh, most Vietnamese people, they support Russia and also they, of course, they, uh, 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 they also support mm. Ukraine. So it's mm. kind of a very close and complicated relation between mm. Russia and the former CIS uh, countries. Right, so Christy said there that it was a little bit complicated they support Russia because it's a, a historical, you know, backer and supporter mm -hmm. of Vietnam, but they also support Ukraine. Do you know why? Wh let's explain why they also support Ukraine. Uh, I think it's just like uh, China have been trying to close with Russia and Ukraine at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is go back to uh, when uh, most of their technology is coming from Ukraine and also uh, Ukraine is the major source of agricultural product uh, for China. Uh, I like to bring back to why um, Ukraine had been close to Russia. It's um, after the 1980s uh, border war between China and Vietnam. Vietnam want to get uh, an ally, so they want to seek the friendship from Russia. That uh, brings us back to uh, the North Korean case. North Korea is also try to play the Russia and China at the same time uh, want to play as much to their own benefit as possible. Mm. So uh, when Russia attacked Ukraine, there's uh, two shocking things uh, for Vietnam. One is that they never occurred that this kind of thing could happen. That means uh, with China going to attack Vietnam using the similar mm. kind of uh, model, that's one concern because they are all landed connected. The second thing is all of a sudden they find that Russia has become um, China's uh, ally and even China's uh, follower in that sense. Mm. So um, they have no room to play up uh, in this scenario. So mm. now uh, if they want to uh, fight with China, there's no one mm. to turn to except the United States. So mm. that would mm. let them caught into very difficult uh, uh, strategic position they are having, right? Yeah, um, and, and then uh, yes. I may because mm -hmm. I think there's something to add because I think uh, Vietnam, uh, including the government and the population, ha actually have a much more complicated uh, feeling about this because if uh, Russia is going down, that means China is going <laughs> to be more and more influential, and that is something that Vietnam does not want to mm. see because if you compare Russia and uh, uh, China. They feel China because they have a long border and they have such uh, complicated relation. Mm -hmm. So they consider China as their threat, but they never consider Russia their threat. Mm. So they would actually prefer side with Russia I over think China. It, it, they should be very sense. cautious because <laughs> on the other side, it's the US and mm. also the Western democracy. So they have to be um, clever enough to uh, separate uh, the government's position and the people's position. Mm. Uh, sorry, so could you out outline the differences again between the government's position and the, and the So people's? the government, I, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, because it, it, it takes time and years for them to uh, cut relations or, uh, for example, the uh, arms sales uh, with Russia Russia, so it mm -hmm. takes time, and then they have made it clear that they have their own independent uh, policy, they have their own calculation of their uh, national interests, and it's not likely that they are going to, tra uh, uh, going to transfer from Russia to Western democracy for their weapon supply in the next uh, few years, because they have a, a big a, a big neighbor just mm. uh, across them. So that's the government's position, trying to be either neutral or uh, or not too explicitly supportive mm. of the U.S. But for the population, actually they have population or the um, business sector, they actually are more, they have more flexibility in mm. uh, expressing their uh, opinions. And as we saw in the survey, the Pew survey there, that y yes. they have very positive feelings, the population that is. Yeah. towards the U.S. Yeah, but mm. for that survey, mm. uh, if you consider the uh, more uh, uh, up-to-date survey by mm. ISIS, because the ISIS in, uh, in Singapore, they conducted uh, every year this kind mm. of survey. So if you look at this uh, late, uh, latest survey in the past two years, actually you will still find that Vietnamese uh, population, uh, on the one hand, they do not like China, mm. but on the other hand, they believe that China is going to be 
more and more influential in the region and mm. also in global in, 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 in the in the globe mm. so they expect uh, us to play a bet uh, to play a more important role and and they need to have balance mm. but on the other hand uh, 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 opposite to this uh, people general uh, general uh, uh, populations feeling especially the young uh, generation the government uh, to government and also in particular the party to party uh, relation between uh, Vietnam and China still very 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 close mm -hmm. and there's nothing that the um, the US can compare right now mm -hmm. so, uh, th yes. there's, there's a dual <laughs> system in yeah. Vietnam you have okay. to recognize one is the party party to party relationship is uh, it's better than anyone had expected. So two communist parties, two communist parties, yeah, camaraderie, and they yeah. they they have a sense of uh, there's a Western democracy is going to destroy us. Mm -hmm. We have to unite together. Yeah. But there's mm -hmm. also the government sector. Government sector, uh, they are having a very somewhat different approach mm -hmm. uh, than so you can e even though they are still communist. I mean, right. in a communist yeah. country, right. obviously the government is also communist. Uh, be because the state or the government, they their main task is for, for economic for development, okay. right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, just like I said, uh, the president of the country have been uh, have been forced to retirement uh, because of corruption. He has been responsible for economic development, uh, and some people are calling them they are more pro-American. And yeah. on the other hand, mm. uh, the Secretary General, they are more ch pro-China. So mm. you can see s there's a slight difference mm. between them. Let's briefly touch on Cambodia. Um, Song Lung mentioned there that, of course, Vietnam, in v Vietnam's history, it has been the victim of invasion. However, it has also invaded. Let's talk about the relationship with Cambodia. Well, uh, Vietnam's relation with Cambodia is, again, <laughs> very complicated <laughs> because uh, Vietnam uh, invaded, right? Vietnam invaded Cambodia uh, uh, in history, and then uh, and then China uh, and then China, uh, as a consequence, invaded invaded. They had this war. So, however, uh, in recent years, in modern in modern years, um, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Laos, and also Myanmar, these four countries are actually the uh, comprise of the uh, Indo uh, Indo China uh, Peninsula. So they are right now uh, have the same goal, which is the economic development. So, in view, consider that kind of new direction. They do have this uh, history uh, behind them, but right now, Vietnam is actually one of the largest source for trade and also for foreign direct investment into uh, into uh, uh, Cambodia. Mm. Uh, and Songlong, very finally, um, you know, can Vietnam, from everything that we've discussed, can it seize the opportunity? John Jonathan London called it a once in a century opportunity to make advantage of the um, the global shifts in the world order. I think uh, Vietnam now is the the second largest uh, ASEAN economy, next to Indonesia, uh, and uh, this is a very big powerhouse uh, for a lot of countries. And especially there's some expectation that uh, Vietnam will be uh, a place where if you cannot do business in China, maybe you can come to, to, come to Vietnam. But uh, I think there's a lot of things that Vietnam should have to do. I mean, they cannot rely on a labor intensive industry anymore. They have to upgrade themselves. Uh, they have to move up in the supply chain. And, and I think that is uh, something uh, for the ruling class uh, they will have to decide. And, and another thing, politically, mm -hmm. they will have okay. to reform at the same time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will be very hard for them to, to get over it, right? Okay.